Indigo gold fields, like all the gold fields in the centre of Otago, had their beginnings with the discovery of gold in the, the Clutha River, just below Cromwell, by Hartley and Raleigh in the winter of 1862 of uh, great quantities of gold. Now when the news of this discovery was, uh, was um, published, the uh, hundreds of miners from other parts of uh, Otago and overseas converged on the spot and it wasn't very long before they started to fan out over the whole of the inland Otago in the search for gold. And in due course, they um, working their way up the Clutha River and over Thompson Saddle, they converged on this spot here, this flat area you see out here. And they found that it contained, uh, underneath the gravels, quite rich deposits of gold, alluvial gold. Uh, alluvial gold, of course, as its name applied, is uh, gold that's been washed down by water. And it wasn't very long <coughs> before this uh, whole area was pegged out into alluvial claims. <coughs> now, an alluvial claim was a, a small patch of ground about 24 feet square, or around about seven and a half uh, meters. And uh, it wasn't very long before there were about 150 miners hard at work here. <coughs> um, some, of the, some of the claims were quite uh, uh, <coughs> quite uh, rich. There was sometimes up to about 50 ounces of, of gold a week found here. Uh, and uh, the, this, uh, this, the discovery of the gold here, of course, uh, meant that uh, uh, they had to have supplies. <coughs> and for their supplies, they went down to a small <coughs> shanty village called West, uh, not uh, called um, Wakefield, I'm sorry, Wakefield, on the banks of the Clutha. <coughs> it wasn't very long before uh, a man by the name of William Goodall decided to build a hotel here to satisfy the needs of the, of the miners. And he built this hotel down here about 1867, uh, I think it would be. <coughs> and there you see the ruins of it. It was the first hotel built in, uh, in the Bendigo area, <coughs> and it still remains there a ruin. Uh, William Goodall sold out after about two years and moved down to Bendigo Township. And the, uh, the hotel was then taken over by a man by the name of Charles O'Donnell. It had a rather checkered career after that. Uh, after about 10 years, the, uh, it lost its license because there wasn't very much trade here in, this, in the gully. It was called the Bendigo Gully Hotel, by the way. And um, uh, O'Donnell carried on until he lost his license, but he continued to use it as a general store and a bakery and a butcher shop. He g operated it in that capacity for a until 1907. The population here dwindled by that time, and he, uh, about 1907 it was, his wife died while she was chasing a pig here, and uh, Charles O'Donnell decided to give up. So he abandoned the hotel and uh, retired to Cromwell, and the hotel building was just left to fall to the ruin as you see it now. Now, uh, like all alluvial fields, they ran out of gold in time, and that's what happened here. And the miners, as they worked out their claims, gradually moved away. But before they'd gone, even as early as 1863 it was, one of the miners by the name of, of uh, Thomas Logan <coughs> decided to do a bit of exploration. Uh, he knew, as all miners knew, that these alluvial deposits all came originally from weathered uh, gold reefs further up the mountains. Perhaps they, those reefs had been weathered completely away, but in some cases, traces of them remained. And it was uh, in the hope of discovering one of those uh, a reef that um, Thomas Logan set off up Specimen Gully, which is just over there. <coughs> he was encouraged in his exploration as he moved up this creek by finding pieces of quartz with the gold 
clearly visible embedded in the in the rock and uh, that the fact that there all these pieces lay there um, on the bed of the of that little creek gave was later to give to give it its name specimen gully well he moved on up uh, until finally he came to an outcrop of of court and he took a specimen of it and realized he had uh, he, or at least he thought that he had found a, a gold reef and further exploration found that the reef extended up the mountain and that it was uh, gold bearing. So he returned to to his uh, camp down here and we'll hear more of Thomas Logan as we go further up the hill. Now at this stage we'll move down to uh, the old Bendigo Township. Here we are on the site of the old Bendigo Township. Now, way back in 1860, in anticipation of this becoming a, a quite an important centre, the uh, provincial government sent a surveyor up here to uh, survey a township. And here you see the result. On the plan, you see it was divided into blocks, and the streets were named after um, a, a English mostly English counties and so on, or English towns. We're here where we are, we're standing on the corner of Oxford and York Street. That was York Street running up in that direction there, and Oxford Street at right angles. Now at that time, of course, and subsequent times, there was quite a lot of building went on here. There was a, a store here, and further along was another hotel built. We mentioned William Goodall up at the alluvial diggings. Well, he moved from there down here and built a hotel just along here, uh, about uh, three or four chains down here. Uh, he called it the Bendigo Reefs Hotel. He wasn't in very long before it was burned down, but he got set to and built another one. And unfortunately, he then took ill and he died, and the hotel was sold and was moved away. The only other hotel here was the, was the Solway. It was named after the battery which was being built down on the flat over there. And it was uh, situated just over there. Those poplar trees you see there, I think they were about the end of the, um, the um, hotel. It was in behind there. Its um, site was well, uh, I could be well identify up to about 20 years ago when the two chimneys were, were still left intact. And unfortunately, the chimneys were knocked down to make um, extension to that holiday place you see over there. And so we've lost the uh, exact uh, location of it. The uh, Solway Hotel, operated under the, with the, by a man by the name of Peyton for some years, and then was taken over by a man by the name of Dawson. And he um, was the last uh, owner of it as a licensed premises. It wasn't very long before the population here began to decline and uh, the buildings were moved away and the, the hotel lost its license. It was then used as a private residence for some years by first the Reed family and then the Mann family from uh, who later lived in Cromwell and uh, up to about 1942 it was used in that capacity. At that stage they all moved away and the new owner, or the owner who'd, who'd they'd, from whom they'd leased it, uh, he decided to demolish it. And uh, it uh, was demolished about that period, about 1942. Um, now we have a picture of the old, Sol of the old Solway Hotel. Um, are you ready to see that? Now here's a photo of the, uh, that has survived of the old Solway Hotel. You see it's a fairly basic structure. It was built of corrugated iron, and uh, even inside it was fairly basic. The rooms were, uh, I understand, had no doorways. They only had curtains to pull across. Um, they had no uh, bathing facilities or bathing facilities. And all they did was they went down to the creek, the nearby creek, and had a wash, or brought a bucket of water up for their ablutions. And that, um, but that served its purpose for a good number of years. Um, it was advertised as uh, one of the ad ads it had in the early days, one of the best hotels in Central Otago. 
Well, if that was the best, I wonder what the worst was like. Anyway, that's the story of the of Old Bendigo Township. And from here we'll move up to the reef area. Right in the heart of the reef area. It's called Welshtown because in the early days there were a group of Welsh miners who made their homes here. You'll see the ruins of their cottages round about. We're at a, a, an elevation of about 2,000 feet above sea level here. That's about 700 odd metres. And we get a splendid panorama of the surrounding country from here. Over on the left here you see the, the Pisa Mountains. And away up the, the broad Cooper Valley there, you see the Makero Mountains that lie behind Lake uh, Hawea. Coming around this way, we come to the Grand Hue Mountains, closer at hand. And right over to the right here, you see the uh, St. Bassens Mountains. Now we left uh, Thomas Logan, having found a discovery of um, a reef, only about two or three hundred yards from here was the site where he discovered it, and uh, then returning to down to uh, the alluvial field down below, where he divulged the news of his discovery to two of his mates. One was called Brian Hebden, and the other was uh, William Garrett. And the two of them came back up and further explored the reef and decided that they might do something about it. But they couldn't do much about it because reefs, uh, to exploit a reef requires capital to buy expensive machinery. And uh, they didn't have the capital. So they formed a, a little syndicate amongst themselves and at odd times they come up, came up and worked on the reef just to bring some of the stone to the surface. They uh, opened it up to about two or three hundred uh, yards or about 150 metres. And uh, that went on for two or three years. At last they made a breakthrough. They found an, um, a wealthy man in, the, in the Cromwell by the name of George Goodger, a wealthy businessman. And uh, he was interested in what they, were, what they were doing. They took some of the samples down to him. He had them assayed. And when the result came back of the assay, he said, well, boys, you have a fortune in your hands. Now, the upshot of all that was that he provided the capital and the three partners went ahead to exploit the, uh, the reef. Now, to exploit the reef, it was necessary to get a battery. Uh, a battery was a big machine for crushing the, the, the gold-bearing ore into a fine powder. To be, for it to be extracted. And uh, they set to work, first of all, to get this battery. They bought a, a second-hand battery from somewhere, employed a large number of men, and they erected the battery down on the flat where we first assembled, down on ben, near Bendigo Township. Now, that was some distance from, where the, uh, from the reef up here, so they had to uh, build a roadway down, and that roadway we came, came up on was the roadway they constructed from the, the reef area down to the battery. Um, the, um, when, and they also had to provide power for their machine too, and that was provided with a, a huge uh, overshot water wheel, and you used the water from Bendigo Creek. Um, and uh, after about two years or 18 months hard work, they were all ready to go. Uh, they employed quite a number of carriers who had drays and horses to carry the stone, the gold-bearing stone, down to the flat and they stockpiled it there ready for the opening of their, their battery. By another party on that ridge over there. They named it the Aurora Reef after a little creek that flowed down on this side of it. And they got, got to work and also built a battery. They built their battery though right in the creek bed over there and their, their power came from a, a, a water wheel which was powered, powered by water which was brought by a, ra a race from about 10 miles distant. It came along the top of the Dunstan Mountains here tapping all the little gullies and finally discharged into the Aurora, Aurora Creek. It was picked up and used on the water wheel again. Now the Aurora uh, it operated for some years but um, 
was final and finally ran out. But uh, and there was a, there was quite a, a big um, celebration when it was open. It was going to be a great success, but it didn't turn out as good as they thought. Well, anyway, getting back to the to Logan and uh, the Logan Logan Ridge, they called it. Well, this time they called it the Cromwell Quartz Mining Company. Those four partners, Goodyear provided the finance and the three men, the three others providing the labour. Well, the day came when they had their first crushing, and that there was great, great excitement when the result of that crushing was announced. It turned out uh, as good as they had anticipated, in fact, more so. And when news spread of the success of the Cromwell Quartz Mining Company, it caught another gold rush to this area. A gold rush not to get alluvial, mar alluvial gold, but to, get, to find new reefs. And in no time, or short time, um, various other reefs were discovered. Besides the Aurora, next to it was found the Anderson Reef. The discoverers gave them names as they, as they found them. Next to that was the Lucknow Reef. Next to that was the, uh, the Bradfoot, then the Gowano. Then the new load, and uh, finally you came to Bendigo Creek away over about two miles from here. Over on the other side on our left was the B load and the hit or miss. Logan's Reef ran quite close to where we were standing here. And all the reefs ran in a, a, north, uh, a slightly easterly, east-west direction. And they all so, uh, dipped down at, the, at about the same angle, sloped down into the ground at about the same angle. Well, uh, as I say, this caused a gold rush to here. Uh, at one stage there were about 80 claims taken up and about 100 and, uh, 214 shareholders, I think it was. And I might mention here that a, a quartz reef claim was quite different from an alluvial claim. A quartz reef, cl reef claim was 18 chains by 9 chains, or around about 360 metres by 180 metres. A rectangular area, quite a big area. Uh, and uh, along these newly discovered reefs, these new claims were pegged out and surveyed. Now, not all the reefs were gold bearing. Some had none, some had uh, enough just to perhaps get a wee bit excited about it. and uh, there weren't many there weren't any that were nearly as uh, rich in uh, in gold as the aurora and the uh, and uh, logan's reef and so um, the excitement con continued for some time and then finally subsided as they found that the reefs weren't as good as they had thought uh, of course, accompanying the, the gold rush, um, a little village grew up here called Logan Town. We're going to down down the to see it later on. We'll talk about it then. Um, after about perhaps within 18 months, most of these newly made claims had been abandoned, and life settled down. Uh, the centre of activity being Logan's Mine. Stop it. Load about loads and reefs and so on. Now those are synonymous terms. A load and a reef are the same thing. We've also been talking about a battery. I better explain what a battery was. It was a machine designed to crush the stone, the gold-bearing stone, into a fine powder. Uh, it was had to be worked by quite a considerable amount of power and mo and. Uh, in the most of the batteries around here in this area were worked by huge water mills, water wheels. Now, um, to understand what a battery looked like, we'll, we'll have a look at a photo of one. Now, here's a photo of a battery still in existence, the, the remainder of it, way over in the Rise and Shine Creek. It gives you some idea of what a battery was. You see those six rods or five rods? At the end of those were large weights. And when the battery operated, the stone was fed into the, uh, 
a, tr uh, a trough underneath, a big steel trough or iron trough, and uh, the batteries, one at a time, they were lifted up and dropped onto the stone and crushed it to a powder. Now, I think uh, you'll see another photo here of those, those big weights, stampers they were called, actually were used to crush the gold. Right, there you see the, the actual stampers, these huge weights that went up and down, crushing the stone. Now, the recovery of uh, the gold from the stone uh, took place as follows. The crushed stone, quite a fine powder, was then washed by water over copper plates or tables which were covered with mercury. Mercury is used quite extensively. Now, mercury and gold combined to form an amalgam. And as the gold particles, as they passed over the mercury, were amal amalgamated with the mercury. And the particles of stone, the waste, was washed on as tailings. Now, at a suitable interval, the, the amalgam was taken from the plates and it was put into a retort and heated. A retort was, it was usually a cast iron uh, retort with a lid and a pipe going down to another level. Uh, mercury, of course, has a, a very low um, evaporating oh, uh, uh, point, and at a certain heat, the mercury evaporated, or turned into a vaporized, I should say, and continued down as a vapor down the tube, and then went back to its liquid form. The, li the mercury now was separated from the gold, and down in the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, retort was left the lump of gold, or the cake of gold, as they called it. Go. Well, here's a, sh a picture showing me an actual cake of gold with some of the, the old miners behind it. And that gold, in, its, in that form, was taken down to the bank in Palmer and deposited there. Well, from its initial uh, crushing, the Cromwell Quartz Mining Company conti continued on its merry way, bringing in huge dividends for its four par for the four members of the syndicate. Uh, the three uh, by Hebden, Logan, and uh, and uh, Garrett were now wealthy men. They could afford to sit back, and in fact, they decided to retire. Garrett was the first one. He decided to uh, give up about 1871, I think it was. And uh, before he'd sold his shares, though, he died. He was bucked off his horse down the Lowburn Hotel and broke his neck and was buried in the old Cromwell Cemetery. That left only three partners. They bought up Garrett's uh, um, shares and carried on as, a, a three of, as three of them in the partnership. But it wasn't many years before Hebden decided to give up, and he sold his shares to some outsiders, and uh, he went back to, to his hometown in England, where he set up a business called Albion House in Ripon in Yorkshire, and became quite a wealthy man. He used his capital to good effect. Logan, the other partner, he uh, sold his shares, and he remained about the district here for some years, um, investing in other mines, was quite a prominent citizen in Lowburn. Finally went back to uh, Australia where he'd originally come from and uh, had a successful career as a, a railway construction constructor over there. For some strange reason he came back to New Zealand almost penniless in the early, in the 80s and died after a six months illness in the Dunedin Hospital and he was buried in the uh, in the South Dunedin South Cemetery. Uh, now, that the, of the original shareholders, Goodyear was the only other one. He carried on as a shareholder for some years. He finally ran into financial difficulties and finished up by taking his life by by jumping into the river down at Cromwell. So, apart from uh, from Hebden, they didn't have very uh, didn't live very long to reap the benefits of their early discoveries. <clears throat> now, uh, 
the success of the of the common man um, evoked other other thoughts in those people who had had abortive uh, uh, claims further over than those others. They all, there were quite a few few uh, more claims were were taken. Uh, they were clustered around the the uh, the Cromwell mine. Some of them didn't even know, they didn't even know whether there was a, a reef there. <coughs> but there were quite a few. And they were all given fancy names. There was the Dauntless, the Kiss Me Quick, the Come in Time, the uh, Who'd Have Thought It, the Dauntless, the New Britain, and about two or three others. Now um, they were worked on the principle, of course, that because the Cromwell mine was getting such good returns. There must be other gold near at hand, but it didn't turn out that way. And in a very short time, those those uh, claims were uh, cancelled. And uh, uh, the only one, the only uh, uh, mine working was the uh, Logan's mine. Now the the mine was the reef was exploited in various ways, but the main one was. Uh, shafts were put down after they got down a certain distance. Shafts were put down here and there all the way along the length of their claim. And um, at the top of each shaft was a, a winding gear. There were, two, there were two types of winding gear. One was a, what they called a whim shaft and the other was a whip shaft. A whip shaft was just purely a, a pulley on top of the shaft <coughs> over which ran a rope. And one end of the rope was attached to a horse, and the other end was attached to a bucket or something like that that went down the shaft. When the horse went forward, the bucket came up. When the horse went back, it went down. And in this day, way, men and tools and so on were lowered down and, lo and brought up, and the gold-bearing stone was brought to the surface. There was one quite serious accident occurred in one of the whip shafts. Um, one of the miners was about to descend, put his foot in the bucket to go down, and fortunately the other end hadn't been attached to the horse, so he plummeted down 30 feet down to the bottom of the, the shaft. It wasn't killed, he only had an injured foot, and was back in work in a few weeks' time. That was just one accident that happened. The other type of, uh, of uh, hauling gear was what they call a whim shaft, and uh, it was similar. There was a, a pulley on top of the mine, except the other end of the rope went to a kind of windlass, and the windlass was attached to a horse and long arms, and perhaps one or two horses went round and round in a circle, winding up the rope, and uh, whatever was on the end of it. And then to uh, lower everything down the mine, they went in the reverse direction. Now by, by um, about 1878, uh, they were getting very deep, and these methods of bringing the, the good um, stone to the surface were becoming uh, a, wee, uh, a wee bit expensive. So they decided to modernise the mine, <coughs> and to do this, all operations ceased while they uh, reorganised. Uh, they decided to bring the battery up to the uh, right up to the reef area. So it was shifted, taken bits, transported up by horse-drawn wagons and drays, and re-erected at the um, right at the mouth of the uh, the, end, at the end of the reef area, and they started putting it down a big shaft there. At the same time, um, they uh, got a steam engine and erected it to drive the machinery, to drive the battery. Now, um, that, that took quite a, quite a while, and they also extended the, the number of heads. On that picture of the, of the battery, you notice that there were about five or six um, uh, stampers. Now, they could have anything up to 14 or 15, even up to 18, all in a row. And uh, I think it was up to 18 that they extended their, their battery to. And after everything was ready, the battery was christened the Matilda Battery, after George Goodyear's eldest daughter. <coughs> Shows you the Matilda Mine and the Til Matilda Battery about the 1880s, when it was in full operation. 
you can see the poppet head in the centre there over the top of the main shaft just a small building to the left of that is the engine shed which provided the winding power then the bigger shed housed the battery where the, where the quartz was crushed further over on the left you'll see two small poppet heads as if they were just being erected they're, they're over the top of two quite, quite big shafts that are still visible there further along you'll see the blacksmith shop that's the only building still remaining there. Up behind the poppet uh, head, you'll see another building. That was the mine manager's house. There's one other building which we don't know uh, w was used for, and uh, that about completed the complex there. The miners, of course, lived in their cottages some distance away. Now this shows you a vertical section of the mine it was at that time. You will see the. Uh, the main shaft right an extreme left there. It's not the scale of course and you'll see the uh, quite a labyrinth of, uh, of shafts and uh, drives and so on that uh, were driven into the mountain to bring the, the stone back to the crusher to be crushed. The miners down below of course uh, used picks and uh, shovels as well as a lot of explosives. Mostly, well it was all black powder in those days an enormous amount of black powder were used to blast the rock into small pieces so it could be transported on the little trolleys they had or little trucks along rails along to the foot of the of the poppet head and then raised to the surface to be crushed. Well this uh, continued till about 1884 this prosperity of the mine by this time the mine had been turned into a a liability company, a limited liability company, and it had quite a lot of shareholders. They were getting good good divvies out of the proceeds of the mine. But by 1884, or round about that, it was becoming more difficult to uh, extract the stone, mainly because they were getting deeper and they were running into uh, water, and they had to install expensive pumps to pump out the water. About this time, it was decided that they would try elsewhere for their gold. In, um, in their claim was another load called the North Load. So they thought they'd, tr they'd try their luck there. And uh, they proceeded then to sink uh, a huge shaft on, on above, the, of the, above the North Load in the hope of striking uh, payable stone. And here's a photo showing the, uh, the, the activities at the number two shaft. Ready? Go. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Now the failure of the uh, of the number two shaft spelt the end of the of the company. Their returns were getting smaller and smaller and so they decided to sell up. They sold up to another company and the whole uh, workforce was dismissed. Now a new company took over and one of their first acts was to uh, start a, a low level edit. They reasoned that if you could, uh, if we could put a uh, tunnel in, an edit was a, a, a horizontal tunnel, in through the mountainside and strike the reef at a lower level, it would do away with all the long haulage to the surface and also the water taking, the water pumping problems. So they began uh, using their capital to put this uh, low level edit. Well after they'd been for a few hundred feet, they never hadn't struck the, uh, the, the reef, they'd run out of capital and so they sold up to another company. And from then on, that was the typical of the history of the, the mine. Another a company taking over a certain amount of capital, working at it either the edit or the, the mine itself, getting very poor returns and then handing over to another one. Finally, about in 1913, the whole lot of the company that was in possession at that time sold up and the whole of the assets were dismantled and sold. The battery, the pipes, the hauling gear, the engine, everything. And that was the end of the, the mining in this, in this particular area here. The biggest uh, ruins in the Wellstown area was, uh, was Pengelly's Cottage, which you see over in the hillside here quite a substantial cottage. For some reason or other, it's got, people have got the idea that it was once a hotel. Well, it was never a hotel. 
Uh, it was the cottage of uh, the Pengelly family, who were quite prominent in, the, in this district for quite a number of years. Uh, the nearest approach it ever got to being a hotel was about 20 years ago, when it was made to represent the hotel for the filming of Tom Winter's Dream by J.K. Baxter. And uh, they put a, a temporary roof on it and used it for that purpose. But that remains uh, a ruin of Penn Gillies Cottage. And uh, don't take any notice of the of the de of the dark track which which designated you know. <coughs> What you've just seen is the site of Logantown. I mentioned up the hill that with the arrival of all the, uh, the people who are looking for reefs, gold-bearing reefs, the population over here increased so much that business people decided to, put a, to build premises up here. This was the only level piece of ground they could find. So up and down here, about 1870, there was quite a little village. There were two or three stores, there was a blacksmith shop, there were two restaurants, there was um, a billiard room, and of course there was the usual hotels. In this area there were five hotels altogether. And there was the Provincial, the uh, Golden Link, the Reefers Arms, and the Old Bendigo in this area. And further down towards the creek down there, the Aurora Creek, was another hotel called the Aurora Junction. So there were five hotels here altogether. It had a fairly brief existence. After only about a year or a bit more, uh, when the bubble burst, as far as the reefs were concerned, they began to move away. And in, in a very short time, uh, there wasn't much time left of the, of the new township of Logantown that had been here. Um, now you'll realise that many of the, the miners had wives and children and in due course the time came when they needed education for their children. To begin with they, they employed a teacher privately and their school was a corrugated iron structure up at uh, Logantown which we recently visited. Uh, it was used for all kinds of purposes. It was more or less what we'd call a community hall. It wasn't very big and that's where the children were educated. The parents paid in so much to uh, provide the teacher's salary. But in due, due course, they applied to the education authorities for a proper school, one which was financed by the education department. And after some negotiation, in 1980, that was granted. Now, they had to choose a site, and this was the one that was chosen. You wonder why they chose a, a flat piece of ground up here above Bendigo Township. But the reason was that many, most of the children, or perhaps half of them, came from way up at the mines where we recently visited, and the other lot came from farms down on the flat. So this was a compromise, about halfway between, and it seemed to have been settled very amicably, the site for the school. So there are wooden schools built here, and the only remains of it now are that, that chimney which you see over there. Um, the school itself was operated here till about um, 1910. Uh, it was closed for a few years and then was, uh, in 1910 it was shifted away down onto the main road because all mining had ceased up here. Now there's a rather a curious entry in the um, in the old exam records of the of the Bendigo school. Uh, at that time Charles Todd was the manager of the mine and uh, his family including Charles Todd Jr. were um, pupils here. The entry reads, uh, at the request of the parents the Todd children are not to be taught history. Uh, now Charles Todd Jr. may not have been taught history but he certainly made history. After he left here there was a, a boy who went down to Harriet and uh, later on he established a, a stock and stage and station agency there 
went into motors and, started, and found the tired motors in the Dunedin and finally finished up by heading the, the big tired consortium which is uh, uh, which is uh, centred in Wellington. So Charles Todd uh, had a very humble beginning at his uh, Bendigo school here. Now here's a photo of the group of pupils of the, of the Bendigo school taken about 90, 1899. Uh, you'll notice the teacher at the right hand side that was Mr Grant. He later became quite a prominent headmaster in the meeting. Uh, there's quite a, a girl there, she looks almost like a young lady. Now, uh, she probably was, was just a pupil because in those days some, pe some uh, young people didn't get any education at all, at all until they were in their teens and came along to a primary school just to catch up if they could. Right, uh, well about 1930, what would it be about that time, during the Depression there was quite a revival of gold mining all over the Otago, including the Bendigo area here. Uh, one of the, th the companies that was formed to, to uh, look for gold here uh, took over the old adit I was telling you about a, a little while before. Uh, the idea was to, uh, to put a tunnel into the mountain, and it was called an adit, and uh, strike the, the, uh, the reef at a lower level that would save all the necessity of machinery and pumps and so on up above. So in 1930, after several tr uh, companies had had a go in the earlier years, the, uh, a company was formed there by Charles Todd, Jr., who I referred to up in the, at the school, the one who wasn't taught history. But anyway, he came down, he formed the company, they put some mo a lot of money into it, and started extending the edit. They went in about uh, until they, they finally ceased work at a total distance of 2,000 feet. Now that's getting on to uh, 800 to 700 uh, meters in the round about there, which is quite a long distance. They did, found no money, found no uh, gold, lost all their money, and that was the end of that adventure. To, to the abortive added place down here. You see a large hole here. excavated here. Now, there was a group of Dunedin businessmen uh, thought there might be gold under these gravels here. They did test borings and sure enough they found at a certain depth there were quite uh, extensive deposits of gold. And they thought the best way to get the gold out was to build a dredge. So a dredge had to be floated in water. There was no water here. So they decided to make an artificial pond to float the dredge. They engaged a, a couple of young unemployed men who got the co contract and they, with a bucket, of, a traction engine and a, a scoop, they scooped out this enormous hole you see here. Now those two um, young men, that was the beginning of a very successful career for them because their names were Mr. Hogan and Mr. Fulton. You've heard of them, haven't you? Fulton and Hogan. Uh, well anyway, the company then filled the, uh, the hole with water from Bendigo Creek and then proceeded to erect the dredge, which they bought from south from somewhere, to the, the building of the Gold Bike Company's dredge here at Bendigo, partially completed. And this photo shows you the completed dredge working. It was uh, on the bank and finally launched it onto this pond that they had, uh, artificial pond which they'd made. And the idea was there then for the dredge to float there and the buckets would go away down and bring up the gold bearing uh, gravel and they were going to make their fortune. Well, unfortunately, like what Burns said, the, ga the best made plans of mice and men gaffed after glee. Well, this certainly went to glee anyway because they couldn't reach the, the lower levels of the, of the gravels. As soon as they, uh, all of the gravels were brought in one end, had to be tipped out the other end, the, the tailings at the far end, and they kept floating in, in underneath the dredge, and the dredge, they couldn't get the dredge down far enough. The idea was to lower the water 
and then they'd reach the, the gold at the bottom. They called themselves the the Bendigo Gold Light Company. I interviewed the, the last remaining director of it about 20 years ago down in Chicago. And he said, for all the gold that we got out of that hole, we should have called the, the Bendigo Light Gold Company. And uh, so after a year's operation, they tried various things to, uh, to rectify the fault, but they could never get down to the gold bearing gravels down there. So after a year's operation, the uh, reeds ceased operations, and uh, it was finally dismantled and sold. And with the demise of this dredge here and that effort, the curtain comes down on all major gold winning efforts in the Bendigo area.